For nearly two decades, ESPN broadcasts and an accountant named Moneymaker have given rise to a generation of poker players dreaming of turning professional and earning millions. I think everybody is just chasing those big six-figure, seven-figure scores. But poker is a game of high risk. It's worse than the stock market to a very significant degree. And high reward. I took home about $700,000. That money was won despite never entering a casino. Poker is for sure not always what it seems. It makes it sexier when you think that a player is taking home, you know, $10 million. In reality, a lot of these players aren't taking home even half that sometimes. Apparently some players um, agree to sell a part of their winnings in return for guaranteed cash up front. So how did you do that and how much of the, what is it, eight, almost nine million dollars will you actually keep um, after tax? It's called staking. Poker staking is having someone put up money for another poker player to use, normally to enter a poker tournament. I did sell some pieces to some friends just to uh, just to give them sweats. Pretty much everybody I know that is in poker is at least selling action or swapping action or is staked full time. I, I really don't know anybody who, who doesn't do it once in a while. Backing and staking are the financial lifeblood of tournament poker. For years, it took place between poker professionals, but today, entrepreneurial players hope to open it to the world. We wanted to make it really simple for both the pros, the players, and the people, the fans, to get in on some action or sell some action, whatever side you're on. With more access comes regulation and uncertainty. It was an investigation trying to figure out this business model. From fans to amateurs to pros, staking is the most common method of success and survival in poker. Playing poker for a living is incredibly tricky. A lot of people come out to Las Vegas with absolutely bright-eyed dreams and leave on a Greyhound bus not that many years later, realizing that it couldn't come to pass. The amount of variance involved in, in tournaments is astronomical. It's, it's honestly, it's worse than the stock market to a very significant degree. So a lot of professional poker players sit back and say, okay, I know I can make money if I enter as many poker tournaments as possible because the law of large numbers is then on my side and having the financial wherewithal to withstand that can be difficult. Whether online or at a casino, players must put up a buy-in, the minimum amount to sit at a table. Buy-ins can range from a few dollars to thousands or even a million. The higher the buy-in, the bigger the payout. Let's say you're a professional living in Las Vegas and you play you know, mostly $300 to $1,000 buy-in tournament and you ran like a $500 average buy-in. I would say to be comfortably rolled for those games, you need about $100,000 poker specific bankroll. And then you should also have about a year's living expenses as well saved up. You know, if you're living like a normal middle-class lifestyle in Vegas, that might run you about four grand a month. So you would need $150,000 total bankroll. This is where staking comes in. Poker staking is having someone put up money for another poker player to use, normally to enter a poker tournament. In return, they receive part of your upside. So by way of example, someone want to enter the World Series of Poker for $10,000. They may say, all right, I'm going to put up $4,000 of my own money, and I'm going to go raise $6,000 from backers. Backers love it because it gives them an opportunity to have an interest in the outcome of a poker event. And some of these poker tournaments, especially up top, pay exponential returns. You can make 250, 300 times the money you give your staked poker player if he or she does well. Staked poker players got a bigger bankroll. They can play more tournaments. They can make more money over the long run. Pros need it to give themselves the exposure to enter as many tournaments as they can. Semi-pros often need it to help make the next step up. There's just something about not having that pressure and not having to risk any of your own money ever. It's, it's just uh, very freeing. To understand the popularity of poker, you have to go back two decades. It's a five. Yeah! This was 2003. The internet and hit 1998 movie Rounders paved the way for Chris Moneymaker's World Series of Poker win. He'd earned a seat at the table by playing online poker on a site called PokerStars. An accountant one day and $2.5 million richer the next, 
this fairy tale story launched poker into the mainstream, becoming known as the Moneymaker Effect. Like a lot of people in poker, I got in when Chris Moneymaker won the World Series of Poker in 2003. I deposited some money in an online poker site and pretty much fell in love with it right away. I was playing poker around 13, 14 years old at a soccer camp. A friend of mine brought in plastic chips and we just started playing. You know, we saw it on TV. It's around the moneymaker time, 2003, and uh, ESPN was on and we started playing just with a group of guys. I first got into poker, much like most people my age. I just watched it on TV growing up. Chris Moneymaker, with his amazing last name, won the World Series main event and he was just this amateur player and kind of gave a lot of just average people like me the idea that, oh, I could be playing poker just like these guys on TV. The World Series of Poker became must-see TV on ESPN. The entries for the $10,000 buy-in main event tripled in the year after Moneymaker won, doubled in 2005, and reached a new height in 2006. And it grew and grew and grew. And people would enjoy playing poker online, so they'd go to their local casino. And that meant more casinos kept coming because there was a financial demand for it. And the fields for live poker tournaments and live poker cash games got bigger and bigger. Increased popularity meant more players with dreams of turning pro and a demand for financial backers. Unless playing tournament poker is your retirement strategy or what you want to do with a trust fund or some well-placed inheritance or your spouse's income, if that's the only way you're looking to make money in the poker world, being backed is almost essential. It is the financial currency that keeps the poker world afloat. Staking works in one of two ways. The short-term agreement is buying and selling action. Action is another term for just buying a piece or buying a percentage or buying shares in a poker player. And usually for a markup. Think of it as a service fee. If the player wins or cashes, the buyer receives a percentage of the winnings pro rata to the investment. If the player loses, the buyer loses. If I see a player um, posting about having action for sale and I know that they're pretty good and they have you know, um, a reasonable markup on that, um, yeah, I'll just buy it. The most I've won from buying a piece of a tournament was from one of my good friends, Jake Balsiger, in the World Series main event. He ended up getting third place for about three and a half million dollars, and I had about 17% of him. I took home about $700,000. A friend of mine, Thomas Cannoli, and I had, I think, five other guys who we bought, we split up a piece with, um, and it, I just remember when he made that final table, it, it was so exciting, because like guaranteed a million, I had around 15%. You're talking about a $1,500 investment, roughly, who's guaranteed a million now. It was, it was very, very fun. Alternately, a player can agree to a long-term backing deal, which means a backer or the investor fronts all of the money for the games a player enters. Revenue is split 50-50. Lisa Costello is part of a stable or a group of poker players backed by one or more people. Each poker player in the stable is called a horse. At this point in time, I had been playing full-time for about a year, and a good friend of mine who I've known most of my life offered to stake me Full time. So I said, yeah, let's do it. The terms of that staking were pretty standard, which is 50-50 um, split with um, a makeup. The biggest difference between buying action and a long-term backing agreement, a player must pay back debt before taking a cut of the revenue. If a player is in the red, they are in makeup. If I play 10 grand in tournaments and I bust through all of them, my next tournament score, that 10 grand has to be paid back to the backer prior to splitting those profits in a 50-50 fashion. The tournaments I typically play run anywhere from 400 to 1600 bucks per tournament. But then in the summer, I'll play a few bigger buy-ins, including the $10,000 main event. Ryan LaPlante is a 2016 World Series of Poker winner, earning him a coveted bracelet. It's like a boxing belt. He's part of a stable called Team 651. I've been with my current backers since 2015. So I've been with them for four years now. I don't really have a set bankroll with them. I essentially just say, hey guys, I wanna play this event. They're like, okay, sweet, that's it. 
A lot of backers are willing to sort of train their stables, give their stables insight, go over hand histories with their stables, and that not only gives them the financial wherewithal to make it as a poker pro, but it gives them some coaching on the side. Definitely would not be the player I am today without their backing and coaching and mentoring. I wouldn't have my bracelet. I wouldn't be playing high stakes right now. So, you know, finding someone like that to really help grow me as a player has been, you know, ridiculously powerful and just so, so profitable for me and for them. Despite the freedom of playing with someone else's money, players carry the weight of debt. I've ironically had my worst year of poker ever, which is crazy because during that time I was getting coached and studying a ton. So right now I'm in makeup for about 50,000. The deepest I've ever been in makeup was $90,000. And in order to get out, I had to fix my mindset, really work hard on my game, stop tilting, and I needed to run well. And it all kind of came together and I made like 120 grand over the next like six weeks and cleaned out a makeup and got a good profit shop and all that kind of stuff. When you have that much makeup, it definitely sucks, but obviously you wanna get out of it, so you're definitely not gonna stop playing. Having said that, I try to be responsible in choosing my tournament, so I'm not just gonna go and fire away at $2,500 buy-ins and get it even higher than it already is. As difficult as it can be to turn a profit in poker, backing arrangements do pay off. Under them, I've probably cashed for $2.5 million. I've had a bracelet, four World Series of Poker Final Tables. I've won hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars online. The last two and a half years alone, I'm probably profiting around a million dollars, pure profit, the tables. So it's been a very good, you know, deal for both of us. If I had the opportunity, I don't think it mattered um, how much I made in poker. I would love to always be staked. For other players with cash to invest, full-time backing and running a stable becomes a business. Over the last few years, uh, playing poker and buying pieces in tournaments have been the most lucrative for me. And I would say those are about equal. Full-time backing so far has not been very profitable, but I'm hoping to make it the most profitable in the future. Derek Walters has backed roughly 20 players over the last four years and backs five currently. I think what first got me into backing was just this magical idea that I could make passive income just with the extra poker money that I'd made that I have nothing to do with, like owning a rental property or maybe owning some stocks. Now I kind of see it as a more all-encompassing like partnership where I'm just trying to make these guys like the best humans that they can be and then a side effect is that they're going to have success in poker. Some agreements are on paper while others are a handshake. There's a lot of trust between both parties, so no one runs off with the money. Derek only works with people he's known for at least a year. I will have anywhere from 50,000 to 200,000 invested at once, so the players will be holding that amount of money, or even more of that will be in makeup. An agreement can end at any time. However, if the backer ends the agreement and the player is in makeup, the backer forfeits the debt. If the player decides to end the agreement and is in makeup, usually he or she will quit poker. For the guys I back, I would say if they're living up to their potential, doing their best, I think these guys can make between $50,000 and $100,000 playing poker a year. For each of them, I would be able to make half of that or less for the better performing players because I'll have to give them a higher percentage of the profit for their good performance. What if I told you that this was not a dream? This isn't fantasy as usual, it's better. The fan and the pros have never had a way for them to connect, besides like through social media and things like that, but there'd be no way really for um, Antonio Esfandiar as an example to sell action to some random person in Denmark. State Kings invites professional poker players to sell action in upcoming tournaments. Fans can buy the action for a markup, and if the player wins, the fan wins. It makes it really simple for our users to buy action and anybody they want on the platform. Once a package closes for a pro, the money is automatically transferred to that pro's cashier, and then from there the pro can cash out to 
their bank, PayPal, whatever it may be. And it just makes the process seamless and really simple, but also really safe. State Kings has close to 50,000 users and over 150 poker pros listing action, including Antonio Esfandiari, Brian Rast, and Jeff Gross. Here we are, boys. The ones! Them ones! Woo! A site like State Kings is just right place, right time. It's really, for me, I use it for an engagement tool where on my, on my Twitch stream, people always ask me, I get messages, Twitter messages, DMs, hey, can I buy a piece or I'll stake you or can you do this? Well, on this platform, instead of having to text 10 friends or two friends even, because they're, they're, I'll be honest, the annoying part of staking is uh, the accounting because it's like, you have to keep track, you got pieces, you got to collect, you got to give all that. So it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a work, right? You don't want to, you'd rather do it with the one or two guys than 10 people. Well, State Kings handles all that. Players like Jeff Gross are driving millions of dollars in buying and selling action. In 2018, we sold a total of $6 million in total action that we sold on our platform. And we'll usually take around a 10% transaction fee. Some of those are promotional packages where we won't take any fee at all, we'll take 5% fees. So our revenue overall is gonna be between that, you know, 300 to 600,000 in revenue on the 6 million in sales. There's also Ustake. Founded in October 2013, it takes an open approach. Ustake is an online platform that allows fans from across the world to go ahead and back poker players. And it's for any poker player. We don't just have pros. We have pros, we have semi-pros, we have recreational players. So it basically gives anybody a chance to try to raise money to play in events. It's really allowing folks to safely and securely and transparently back somebody and know what's happening and know they're gonna get paid. Backers and players come from 109 different countries. Despite a smaller user base, Ustake also attracts top players to sell action, including Greg Raymer, Todd Brunson, Phil Helmuth, Johnny Chan, and Mike Matisau. I can give some numbers, it's a private company so I can't do all, but um, I can tell you that we've got uh, well over 14,000 users on our system today. We've been growing that about uh, 4X year over year. Our revenue has been going up. We've been pretty much doubling uh, almost every year. Staking may not have been new for the poker community, but it was for the mainstream. And with any new concept, problems can arise. Not long after I became general counsel to use stake, and we were taking care to sort of button up all of its affairs and make sure everything was squeaky clean in case prying eyes ever looked at its books, we discovered that prying eyes were in fact gonna be looking at its books. Ustake received a subpoena from the United States Securities and Exchange Commission, which had launched an investigation into its activities. It was a investigation by the SEC into Ustake and the business. And the SEC was basically looking into whether or not Ustake was involved in the purchase and sale of securities. Because people are buying pieces of poker players and those poker players are gonna go make or lose money for their backer based on what happens in a game. Up to that point, we had gotten quite a bit of press. So I don't know if that's what draw their attention to it. Ustake was ready for this scrutiny because it was a squeaky clean operation that was doing everything above board. So the first thing we did was assess the scope of the subpoena produce documents, and every time the SEC said jump, we said how high. We turned over, I believe, tens of thousands of pages of documents. Long story short, it took forever. So then we finally said, you know what? You know, there's a couple outcomes that come from this. So let us put an application in to FINRA, and FINRA being the licensing arm, basically, of the SEC. So we put an application in for a crowdfunding license. And I get a phone call from FINRA a couple weeks later saying, please withdraw your application. And my jaw sort of hits the ground. I don't really know why they do this. And I press the guy and I said, why? He says, well, it's not really a security. And I'm thinking to myself, all right, that's strange. So <laughs> look at the guy from FINRA on the phone. I say, hold on one second. Call my associate, tell her to come into the room. And I say, sir, please repeat that. And he says, we don't think it's a security because you can't fill out a balance sheet. And that's true, you're not buying and selling a piece of an entity. A poker player doesn't have a balance sheet. A poker player cannot go on the New York Stock Exchange, right? Like if a poker player had to list his or her assets, we're pretty much talking about kidneys and other vital organs, which I'm fairly confident you can't sell in the United States anyway. To show good faith, we went dark. 
The site was still there, people could still post, but we did no overt advertising at all. No social, nothing. We just went quiet. Ustake wasn't getting answers in a timely fashion and losing money. That's when their attorney made a decision that was unprecedented. I said, all right, we want to bring an end to this. Let's file a lawsuit against the SEC seeking a declaratory judgment, which is a judicial decree basically, that staking is not the purchase or sale of a security. And I think this caught a lot of people off guard because it's always the SEC that's going out and suing someone. We started going through that process and that's when the SEC came back and said, no, it's okay, we, we're dropping everything, you're good to go. And we reached an agreement that we would dismiss the case, so no precedent was made, investigation's over, and it is the SEC's stated position, as sought in discovery in federal court, that Ustake was not dealing in securities. From the year before to the year we went dark, we dropped 2x in revenue. From the time we went back live to up, we went up 5x from the year that we were dark. It had a massive effect on us, absolutely. There's no judicial decree saying we won, but we won. The dream of playing poker professionally and taking home stacks of money on live TV draws many to Las Vegas. And staking is one way to ensure you never lose all of your chips. I think you can run much higher edges in, in buying pieces and action in people than you can in pretty much any other industry when it comes to investing and buying action. Real estate, you name it, I think poker runs some of the highest edges. I'm proud of, you know, being backed. I mean, that means that there's a, you know, person who has faith in my skill and that, you know, thinks that I'm capable of uh, doing very well. If you want to look at the guys, the top, top players or you know, professionals, there's a lot of work. There's a lot of stuff you can do to get better. And, you know, it's, a, it's really easy to learn, but to master it does take a long time. And you know, I'm still learning every day. And that's part of why I love it.